Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Let's try it again. Good morning. Come on in. Find a friend and sit next to him. If you don't have a friend, be a friend. Introduce yourself to somebody. Good morning. I'm glad that you're here today. My name is Scott. I'm the Family Connections Pastor here. Thank you for joining us in person and online today as you come on in and take your seat. We have a few announcements uh, to bring your attention to. Uh, but we're going to roll that video, Miss Melissa, first today. So if you'd give your attention to the screens, we're going to talk about our uh, Celebrate Recovery ministry. If you'll watch this video with us for the next minute. Hi, I'm Hugh Bass. I'm the leader of the Celebrate Recovery Ministry at First Baptist Church in Mount Dora. I just want to invite you to come and attend Celebrate Recovery with us, even if you're not a member of the church. Celebrate Recovery is for the purpose of helping us all with life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups, which we all experience from time to time. When you hear the word recovery, it's, it's so much bigger than just recovery from substance abuse or drug abuse. There's so many things we all deal with in our lives, with anger, with depression, with family matters, with job issues, and Celebrate Recovery is to help you with those life choices on an everyday basis. We provide you tools that can be used every single day in your walk with God, and we rely upon the healing power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. That's the key to success, and that's what Celebrate Recovery focuses on. So come and join us, even if you have no idea what Celebrate Recovery is about. We'll be able to show you, walk you through it, and explain it to you, and we'd love to have you. I like the guy playing the guitar. <laughs> that's right. So that's Hugh over there, and today is his first Sunday on the guitar. Yeah, first Sunday ever. In fact, it's his first time ever playing the guitar, so <laughs> do pay attention. No, Hugh, thank you. Uh, thanks for playing with us today, and also thank you for leading Celebrate Recovery. If you don't know what it is, you just saw a little bit about, hey, come and find out. It is uh, really to help, but it's more than, uh, was it, Hugh, 30 years, right? They've been doing Celebrate Recovery 30-some 30, 30 years. So our church is new to that program the last several months, but uh, we want you to be able to plug in and find a place that you can come and get help. So don't hesitate. If you have questions about it, see me, uh, see Hugh, um, and we'd be happy to answer some questions. On our website, uh, the Celebrate Recovery page, there's more information. There's a much longer video that will go into more details about that, okay? Some other uh, things to bring your attention to. First of all, welcome. We are glad that you are here today. If you are a first-time guest with us, would you please text the word welcome? We'll put it on the screen. Uh, to the word welcome to that number right there. You can take a picture of it with your phone and text it during the service if you like. 352-704-1577 If you'll text the word welcome to that number We'll know that you're here Be able to pray for you Lift you up in our prayer times during the week And that way we can connect with you We, we, we don't want you to come in and leave Be anonymous We want to know that you are here So would you help us do that By texting that word welcome to that number um, if you would rather not do that There is a, a card that you can fill out In the pew in front of you Or in your welcome folder uh, It should be right there You can fill that out And uh, put that in the um, giving box on the way out today uh, be, that'd be awesome if you would do that a couple exciting things how many of you like baseball you like baseball how many of you don't like baseball you can, you can come anyway abigail you can come anyway so tomorrow night the leesburg lightning how many of y'all like baseball you like baseball all right leesburg lightning family night. i went to the rays game last night it was so close it was a great game and they lost but anyhow this isn't quite the rays but they're a lot of fun they're young uh uh, it's, it's like a farm team uh, called the Leesburg Lightning. We did this last summer. It's a whole lot of fun. So come out it's tomorrow night, 6.30 at the stadium there in Leesburg, the Pat Thomas Stadium. Some of you might have lived here your whole life and not know there's a small baseball stadium in Leesburg. It is there, I promise. Uh, and you come and join us. We're going to have a whole lot of fun tomorrow night, 6.30. If it rains, we'll wait for the rain to stop. If it doesn't stop, we'll just build an ark. So... Um, that's tomorrow night, 6.30 uh, It's also time to elect new deacons to our church uh, And that's really important It's a vital part of our church It's how our church is run So if you would uh, pick up a deacon nomination form They're at the Welcome Center right out front 
uh, and fill that out. Uh, again, they're available at the Welcome Center. Also at the Welcome Center are some awesome posters and tickets for our Southern Gospel Night that we're having on August 14th. Y'all heard about that? Have you heard about it? Yeah, y'all heard about it. All right. And uh, bring a friend. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. Take a poster. Yep, we got posters out. Put a poster up in your neighborhood. Put it uh, up somewhere where people can, people can see it and invite them. There's tickets out there for you to give people to. Uh, give them a ticket and say, hey, I want you to come join us. That's August 14th. Uh, to join us for, uh, for the Southern Gospel Night. Um, and last, it's not in the bulletin, I don't believe today, but was last week, and that is a baby shower for uh, Amber Converso, and uh, it's, that's this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Uh, you may not know Amber, but she's uh, and her family have been a part of the church for a long time, and uh, she is having uh, babies. Babies. I didn't say baby, I said babies. Isn't that awesome? Twins, a boy and a girl. And uh, have you ever had twins, anybody? Have you ever had more than one child? Have you ever had one child? Yeah. You know that she needs our prayer, okay? So uh, she is going to be uh, delivering uh, probably sooner than later. So uh, be sure that uh, you lift her up in prayer. If you can encourage her by a gift, uh, that would be really great. Um, and just come and let her know that she is loved. I've been praying for babies since I started in this position uh, two years ago. I said, we need more babies in this church, and there hasn't been any babies. So I've been praying. And she said, thanks, Pastor Scott, I'm having twins. So I'm going to keep praying. So watch out, ladies. Okay, all right. We, uh, we celebrate life at this church, and we celebrate life. And so we want you to celebrate life with us as we welcome these two precious children into the world in the next few weeks. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you for being with us in person. We're so glad that you're here today. Would you bow with me as we begin our worship today? Father, we thank you. We thank you today for your love. We thank you for uh, Dr. Henry and that he's been able to be with, these, be with us these last few weeks. And uh, thank you for just the time that we've learned uh, more about you through your word with his preaching. Father, help us today to worship you, to hide behind your cross, and the word would penetrate our heart and mind. Father, thank you for our choir, our musicians, our praise team. Thank you for those that are here, uh, not just watching, but worshiping, Father. Thank you for loving us. In your name, everybody said, amen. Before Aaron, before you begin, it is uh, Dr. Henry's, I'm sorry, Aaron, it is Dr. Henry's last Sunday today. Would you please uh, make sure you tell him thank you and uh, personally before you leave today. All right, Aaron.
will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not make you want. Oh, we You're the defender. will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the
break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roll for Christ the King. Oh, special treat for you this morning um, about I, I started to, to this church 10 months ago as the worship pastor and very quickly I learned that we are so blessed with an immense amount of vocal talent in this church and you know churches aren't doing Sunday nights as frequently as they used to uh, and and Wednesday night we really don't have a worship service so I, I started thinking about all this vocal talent we have. What are we going to do with it? You know, of course, we got Sunday morning 52 times a year. Uh, but there's only so much rotation you can do and all this. And so I got to talking with Patty. She's right over here. 
and Patty is super talented. She used to be a part of the Liberty, Voices of Liberty at Epcot Center. Years ago, she was uh, a singer there and still just super talented with a beautiful voice and, and the skill to put together a, a group. So we started talking, and I said, Patty, I just want us to do something missional. I think we could go downtown Mount Dora and sing Christmas carols. We could go to some of the local civic organizations such as the American Legion and the VFW and sing some patriotic music. I said, and definitely we can go to the retirement centers in this area. Raise your hand if you have a family member that is in or has been in an, an ALF, an assisted living facility. I, I do right now. My grandmother is currently in uh, an ALF down in, near, towards Miami. And I know that that can be a very lonely season in life. And I've had a blessing to sing at a number of retirement facilities throughout the years. And man, what a joy to see people's faces. They're so glad that you've come there. Matter of fact, a few days ago, I helped a friend move over in Melbourne. And we were moving boxes. That we're moving uh, my, my wife's grandmother into an ALF. And these... These little sweet old ladies were sitting on the porch there in the hot sun, but they just wanted to be outside, and they held the door open for us. And I saw them, and I said, Hey, when I come back out, I'm going to give you a little mini concert. And so I sang the same song I sang for you on 4th of July, God Bless America, right there on the porch for three little ladies, and they loved it. And yesterday... Me and this little group of people right here, we went to the Brookdale Retirement Center here in Tavares, and we sang a full concert. Solos, trios, duets, quartets. This ensemble sings some music together, and we're going to bless you today with one of the songs that they've learned. Uh, I'm so, so very proud of this group. Here we go.
I'm so glad you all put together that ensemble, and we got to hear you sing this morning. What a great job. That was wonderful. Good morning, church. So good to see you all again and be out here with you again this Sunday. It's hard to believe we've been here six weeks. Man, it's a month and a half. Where did time go? Man, I like Forrest Gump. You know, it's like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. <laughs> I heard from Pastor this week. He, uh, uh, I texted him, told him y'all were being nice, and uh, he was glad to hear that. And so he said they're having. He said he forgot what day it was. I said that he's getting some rest. If he don't even know what day it is, he's getting some rest. And I and then I tagged on. I said don't forget to send your tithe while you're away. <laughs> He sent me back, you know, I tithe and beyond. I'm sure it's coming in. So anyway, pastor's doing good, and we're doing good this morning. Did they talk about the ladies going to have twins? Yeah, I think that's wonderful, and the church getting behind that and supporting that, and you want those little ones coming on. I think that's great. I, 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 over in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, this, this really happened. They, they told me it did. I got a, got a column about it. Anyway, there's this couple that couldn't have children, apparently, and so they wanted to adopt. But they had an unusual request. They went to the children's home, and they said, we want to adopt uh, twin boys, twins. And they said, well, that's a rare thing anyway, and there's a long list. They said, I know it, but we'd like to have twin boys. They said, okay. So time goes by, and they get a phone call. And they say, we from the children's home. They said, we've got part of your request. They said, what do you mean? We've got twin girls, but not twin boys. Would you all be willing to take twin girls instead of twin boys? They said, let's pray about it. They prayed about it. They said, yep, we'll take them. So they sent them. They took these precious twin girls to their home. A few weeks go by, and the children's home comes again. And they say, you're not going to believe this, but uh, we've got twin boys here, and nobody else wants twin boys. Would you all open your home to have twin boys? They said, let us pray about it. They said, well, that was our first request. And so they got the twin boys. And a few months later, guess what happened? Ooh, she got pregnant. And guess what she had? <laughs> Triplets. <laughs> but that's biblical. You say, well, no, wait a minute, that's not in the Bible. It is over in Ephesians, I think it's 3.20. He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you ask or think. So, you know, so be careful what you ask for because he can do more than you ask for. Amen? Amen. Got your Bibles open to the Gospel of Mark. And um, it's a whole chapter. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but we're going to look at the whole chapter. And if you've got a pen or something, uh, so I won't, I'm going to help mark up this chapter because it's a very, it's a difficult chapter but it's a very important chapter. So I want you, I'm going to read just a part of it to get us into the Word. We'll have prayer, and then we'll delve into that whole chapter. I think it'll be a helpful chapter. We've been talking about Jesus' power over fear, over death, over demons, over nature, over illness, over Satan, uh, and circumstances. And today we're talking about His power for living in ends of times and days of difficulty. And this is what Jesus is dealing with in chapter 13. So in honor of God's Word, would you stand as we honor the Word? Uh, Brother Fred, could you move this over just a little bit while, while I'm reading? Thank you so much. We're going to start in verse 1. Chapter 13, the Gospel of Mark. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils, flogged in the synagogues. 
On account of me, you'll stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Let's skip over to verse 32. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. May God bless his word. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this powerful discourse that you gave to your disciples and you left it for us today i pray that you'll speak to us and teach us not only informationally but inspirationally and instructionally so that me may do what you told them to do and you're telling us today watch be alert be on guard so that we will be a prepared people i ask you that the words of my mouth the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And you get great glory alone in your church and in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, now and throughout all generations. And Holy Spirit, speak through me your word. If you don't, I can't. And if anyone's listening here or online that has never taken the most important decision and choice in their life to be saved may this be the day this hour for that transition to begin in jesus name amen thank you be seated signs are very important uh, we look at them we read about them we hear about them listen to these signs just listen really careful there's 10 of them it's not all there's more than that but i just want to read 10 of them and listen and think about where we are today. Number one, the further society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. Number two, the most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. Number three, the people who believe what the media tells them, they believe. Four, the past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, and the lie became the truth. Number five, free speech is my right to say what you don't want to hear. Number six, there's no swifter route to the corruption of thought than through the corruption of language. Number seven, some ideas are so stupid that only intellectuals believe them. Number eight, it's frightful that people who are so ignorant should have so much influence. Number nine, a society becomes totalitarian when its structure becomes flagrantly artificial, that is, when its ruling class has lost its function but succeeds in clinging to power by force or fraud. Number 10, if you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. That was written in 1949. Ooh. You know who wrote it? George Orwell. He wrote a book called 1984. He wrote that book in 49. He died the next year of cancer. He died at 50. That was published in 1950, so that's been 72 years ago. He told exactly what's happening in today's culture in America and in Europe. Okay? Those are signs. He said this is what's going to be happening. How he saw all that, I don't know, but he did it. In the day of passage, Jesus is talking to his disciples and get the context of what Jesus is saying and where he's saying it. Now understand, this is the last week of Jesus' life before he goes to the cross. This is it. 
first part of the week, he comes into Jerusalem triumphantly, and the, on the donkey and the people are saying, Hosanna, and praise him. The next day, he goes into the temple, goes into the temple, and they've desecrated, and so he throws out all the corruption, all the thieves. I'd love to have been there and seen that. Can you imagine chickens and doves flying everywhere and money changes, tables rolling, money rolling everywhere, and Jesus taking, get out of here, get out of here, this is my father's house. That was quite a scene. The next day, he's engaged with the Pharisees, and they're out to kill him. They've already plotted. They, they know what they're going to do, so he's talking to them. On Thursday, uh, he's going to be taken to Gethsemane with his disciples, and on Thursday night, uh, they come and get him. Judas betrays him. They take him for kangaroo court. Uh, he is judged to be guilty, and then the next day, he's crucified on Friday. He's buried that afternoon. Sunday morning, he's r raised from the dead. Hallelujah. So that's the week. Can you imagine what a week in the life of Jesus that was? So in the first of this week where this is taking place, this is like on maybe a Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, his disciples have been with him in the temple. They've seen the Pharisees. They've been out on his case. And they're leaving the temple area, and they're going down what's called the Kidron Valley, and it goes up the other side is the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives is, once you get up on the Mount of Olives, uh, you're facing, if you live this way, you're looking back at the temple, which is on the west. So they're, they're, they, they must have paused for a break. Jesus on the way to Bethany. It's about two miles away. He's got these favorite guys around him, and they said, Jesus, look at that. Look at that magnificent temple. Oh, isn't it beautiful? Look at the stone. Wow, isn't this marvelous? Because that represented the presence of God. To the Jewish people, this was a very sacred place, and that area still is today. And Jesus starts telling them some things. They probably don't like what they're going to hear, but it, they, they can't imagine it. I mean, if you can imagine this temple was magnificent. In fact, it's so large that it occupied at that day in the old city of Jerusalem one-sixth of the territory of the city. That's how big it was. Today, if you go to Israel, you go up there in the Temple Mount where that golden dome is, where the temple was, you can put 30 football fields up there. That's how massive it was. Just not the temple, but the colonnades and everything around it. So it was magnificent. So beautiful, people came from around the world to see it. So magnificent that if you got up early in the morning, the sun's coming from the east, and you're on the Mount of Olives looking west towards the temple, when the sun hit that beautiful stone, it's so bright that you could not, with your bare eyes, hardly look at it. It just it casts such a magnificent light. So you can imagine when they're sitting there with Jesus, they're taking a break, and they say, look at that, isn't this wonderful? And, 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 and then they start saying, well, what, what about this? Jesus starts telling them, hey, it's not going to last forever. And so that's where this is taking place. So this chapter 13 is probably one of the most difficult chapters in the New Testament. And uh, so when I'm giving it to you, you say, well, I don't believe that particular place means that and means that. I understand that. So I'm not trying to be dogmatic. I just want to give you what I have felt comfortable with in looking at this because Jesus is talking about the past and the present and what's getting ready to happen immediately in the future and in long term. And remember, he's talking to a Jewish audience. He's not talking to Gentiles. He's talking to the, these men are Jews. They know their tradition. They know their past. So he's talking to a Jewish audience. And when Mark is writing, it's basically to a Jewish audience. So with that in the background, let's look at this chapter. The chief emphasis in this chapter is these words. If you go through an underline in your version of ESV or NIV, King James, whatever you're using, you'll see the word watch or look out or be alert or be on guard at least five times, maybe six times in this chapter, Jesus uses these words. So that's the emphasis. That's the emphasis. Now, he's going to give some teaching around that, but his emphasis to them and to us is be on the lookout. So, first thing, watch out. Don't be panicked by what you're seeing going on around you, verses 1 to 8. Now, what Jesus is going to do, and I'm going to try to do today, is like uh, some of you have bifocals, some of you have trifocals. You know, I remember I first got my bifocals, and I don't think I ever had trifocals, but I got reading glasses now. But Jesus is going to kind of do like bifocals and trifocals. He's going to look at one era, and then he's going to look with bifocals to another, and with trifocals, he's going to look into another. 
So in this chapter, you're going to see Jesus looking focals, bifocals, trifocals, and he's covering a lot of history and future, immediate future and long-term future. So let's look at that. I'm, if you've got a pen, I'm going to break out these verses the best I understand them because Jesus is kind of like a teacher. If you've been in college or high school, you had a good teacher. They sometimes jump around. I remember in archaeology, my professor at seminary, he'd be going on something. All of a sudden, he'd take off down another road, and he'd go down that way for 10 minutes, and he'd come back to the lesson, and we'd be on the way. Well, Jesus is kind of doing that. He's doing this, and then he takes off on this, and he jumps over here and does this, and then he comes back to this. So that's what he's doing here. So let me give you kind of a breakout of this chapter in, by verses, and you can just put little parentheses around it, go back and study it on your own. Verses 1 to 13 is the fall of Jerusalem is what he's talking about in these verses. Verses 1 to 13. That happened in A.D. 70. When Titus and Roman legions come, they destroy Jerusalem totally, okay? Verses 14 to 23, he's talking about what's called the Jewish War. That was against the Romans. That happened in A.D. 66. That triggered what happened in A.D. 70. So he's having what's happened, the Jewish War, the Jews rebelled against the Roman government, and there becomes terrible fighting and bloodshed. So in those verses, he's talking about this Jewish-Roman war that precedes the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. In verses 24 to 27, that's long distance. He's looking to the end of the age. Verse 28 to 31, he's going to go back to the earlier scene. He's going to go back to verse 14 to 23. He's going to kind of go backwards, for, look back again. In verse 32 to 37, he's talking about time in the unknown future, where he says angels don't know, the Father don't tell anybody, even I don't know. So he's talking about what we call last times or end days. So Jesus is covering, you see, several different eras. So the first one is don't panic. So we're going to look at those first verses because these guys are getting ready to ex experience it there. There are three things that happen in nearly every generation, whether it's then, uh, Middle Ages, 100 years ago, or even now. There's three things that happen continually in the world. Number one, there will be counterfeit teaching, verse 5 and 6. Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, etc., don't be alarmed. So verses 5 and 6, counterfeit teaching. And it came true. When Jesus died, resurrected, ascended to heaven, between the death of Jesus and his resurrection, in A.D. 70, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, there were 14 different people, or 64 different people that said, I'm the Messiah. 64 different people because I'm the Messiah, I'm the one Jesus is talking about, I've come back to save you. So he said, he's telling them, don't be deceived, that's not true, and that came to pass. 64 that we know about said, I'm the Messiah, before the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. So, and, and that's happened even in our day. A guy by the name of John Hinkle, back in 1994, said that he was going to rip all evil. He got a word from God, and God's going to rip all evil out of the world in 1994 on June the 9th. Paul Crouch on TBN, then when Paul was living, he invited him to be in the studio on that day when all evil was going to be removed from the world. Guess what happened on June the 9th, 1994? Nothing. Evil was not removed. If it was, it sure is hanging around today. Okay? But that was a false teacher, and we get a lot of that today. In 1988, some of you may remember this, there was a guy by the name of Whistonet, who wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is Going to Happen in 1988. Anybody remember that? Some of you may remember that. I see your hand. You do. It happened. I mean, it got some people's attention. I had ABC interviewed me to tell me, where are you, you think we're in the last days? You think Jesus is going to be the end of the world? That, it got that much attention. Well, guess what happened? Jesus didn't come and rapture the church in 1988. But that's false teaching. So whenever you, every once in a while somebody come along and they make a prediction that it comes right. Jeannie Dixon did that when she, she said she had a vision that John F. Kennedy was going to be assassinated, da, 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 and it happened. And people began to say, well, Jeannie, they started following Jeannie Dixon. 
The only trouble is she made a lot of other predictions that didn't come true. A true prophet, everything they said will come true, okay? A false prophet, they may make some things are true, some things are not true. So Jesus is saying, watch out for false teaching. Secondly, there'll be crises in the world. There's always been crises in the world. And he talks about that in verse 7 and 8. Wars and rumors of war. There's been 3,421 uh, years of recorded human history. Of those 3,421 years, there's only been 264 years where there hasn't been a war. So when Jesus says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, that's going to be happening. It happens, happen every generation. So he says, don't panic. Don't, don't get all shook up about it. We hear about Ukraine and da 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 and uh, Russia. And, uh, and there's wars going on. It's been going on for most of human history. So he said, just don't panic when you hear about it and see that. Don't let it make you distraught. The third thing are catastrophes in nature. And in verse 8, he talks about that, famines and earthquakes. Well, what happened? After Jesus dies and ascended into heaven, there is a worldwide famine in the Roman Empire. In fact, Paul talks about that in Acts uh, chapter 11, and he goes to do something for the church uh, at Antioch and, uh, because they took an offering and to help the church in Jerusalem. People were dying because of this famine. Uh, the, church, uh, the city of Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake. Vesuvius erupted and destroyed a whole cu culture and they, uh, city. All that happened in just a few years after Jesus said that. So there's been that kind of thing happening right up to today. We read about tsunamis and earthquakes and floods and all those things. So Jesus said, that is a part it's going to keep happening. So don't panic. Don't get, oh, this is the end of, that's a sign, this is the end of time. Not necessarily so. Jesus is telling them, just be alert, but don't panic. That's the first thing. Second thing, he says, watch out, because persecutions are going to come. And in verses 9 to 13, he talks about those persecutions. What kind are they going to be? Verse 9, there's going to be religious persecution. You'll be handed over to local councils, and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you'll stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. There's going to be religious persecution. Some of the most horrible persecutions have come by religious people. Religious people have persecuted other people, even religious people. We have the Inquisition and other things in human history where religious people hurt other religious people or non-religious people. So Jesus said, that's going to happen to you. There's going to be religious persecution. Verse 12, there's going to be family persecution. Brother will betray brother, father is child, children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Well, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? But it happens today. I remember when I was teaching school, I had the uh, joy of teaching sixth grade. I taught sixth grade for one year. It seemed like 30 but I really enjoyed the kids. I had a great, they were a great group of kids. But I had a kid that came in the room, his name, uh, it was Rufus. And I remember Rufus came and he was sullen. And we get on the playground, he'd, he'd pick a fight. He wanted to fight everybody. And I tried to say, man, you can't do that, son. We can't do that. And so I finally got him to go to church with me. And when he went to church with me, he, he accepted Jesus as his Savior. And I saw that little kid transform. I mean, he wasn't picking fights on the playground anymore. He was, he was friendly. He was nice. It was just wonderful to see what had Jesus transformed that kid. And after a while, he says, Mr. Henry, he said, I'd like to be baptized. So I said, we can't baptize you without talking to your parents because he was one of the members of the church, and that's what you all do here. You, you have children say at Bible school. Otherwise, you talk to their parents, which is the right thing to do. So I said, I'll come to your house and ask your dad for permission, and we'll baptize you at First Baptist. He said, please do. So I never will forget, I went to the house one evening. Uh, they lived in a trailer park. His dad came to the door and said, what you want? And I said, well, I'm Mr. Henry. I'm your son's teacher. He said, well, uh, he said, uh, you're not welcome here. I said, well, I just want to tell you I'm happy for your son he accepted Jesus. He said, I don't care if he accepted Jesus. I said, well, he wants to be baptized. He said, no, he's not going to be baptized. I said, but sir, he's, he's, he said, he don't have sense enough to do that. He ain't going to do that. He's not going to baptize that kid. Uh, I, you're not welcome here. He's not going to be baptized. That's enough. Goodbye. 
And then so he basically shoved me out the door. And I saw that kid retreat again. I saw him broken. I saw him crying that day. And he was never the same again. I don't know whatever happened to him. But I saw here's a father who hates Jesus, and he has a son that wants to follow him. And he's, he's, gonna, he's not going to happen. And I've seen also, and more in the last few years, I've seen more children rebelling against their parents for apparently no reason and going completely in the opposite direction that I have ever seen. I mean, situations where sons or daughters say, I don't ever want to see your face again. I don't want you to call me. I don't want you to text me. I don't want to be in touch with you. I, I just, you don't have nothing to do. And I say, well, well why? What? No reason. It is un, it, it's scary to see how much of that's happening. I don't go to a church or anywhere and spend, get to know people very long, and they'll tell me the very thing I'm telling you. We can't believe what happened to our son. He don't want us to see the kids. He won't talk to us anymore. And we ask him, what's wrong? He never answers. Just don't, I don't want to talk to you. But Jesus said that's going to happen. It happened then. It's happening today. And it will happen all the way until the church is taken out. So it's going to happen religiously, the family. It's going to happen in the public. Notice what he says, says in verse 13. Everyone will hate you because of me. But every, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Everyone will hate you. Now, there was a time in our lifetime, you know, when to be a Christian and be a part of the church was, it was a good thing. No longer has that happened. Now, there is definitely a divide between people who do not like Christians or the name of Jesus or the church. And the church in America, as already in some other countries, and it's coming here, is under attack. Why, during the COVID thing, did they try to shut down the churches and let the liquor stores be open? See, it don't make sense, does it? But that's the world that we're living in. A senator uh, from up in Northeast just last week said, I w we should close down all the crisis pregnancy centers uh, where they're trying to save babies' lives. She wants to close down, by government fiat, every crisis pregnancy center that's trying to save babies. Now, that shows the hypocrisy of that whole Planned Parenthood movement of people on that side. Here they are. We want women to have a choice, and we're not there to abort babies. We're there to give them information and give them good health. Here's a pregnancy center saying, hey, we're offering information, and we're going to give you the choice, keep your baby, but if you don't, that's your choice. But we want to shut you down. But you can keep on going over here, and we're going to give you government money to kill babies. In fact, some governments, and they want the federal government to pay to, uh, people to go and have abortions, and we pay our tax dollars to do it. Now, that is what Jesus is talking about. And we're living in that kind of culture today. So Jesus said, watch out, persecutions will come. But he said, he who is faithful to the end will be saved. Now, he's not talking about the end of the tribulation. He's talking about to the end of your life. So you're faithful to Jesus till the end of your life. Don't turn back. Stay true to Jesus, and he who is faithful to the end will be saved. I have a professor friend uh, just retired at New Orleans Seminary, and he was pastoring a church. He had a man that was built monuments. So he called the pastor, called Mark one day. He said, Pastor, you're going to be at home for a while? He said, yeah. He said, I, I, want, to, I want to bring you a gift. And so he said, okay. And so that one morning he pulled up a pickup truck, backed up, and he said, come on outside, I want to show it to you. And he opened up the pickup truck, and there was a tombstone with his name on it. <laughs> he said, you, are you, I'm your pastor. Are you trying to get rid of me early? I mean, here's, here's, you got my own tombstone with my name on it. Had the date of his birth, and left the place over there for his death. He said, no, pastor. He said, look at the bottom of what this tombstone says. And the bottom of this tombstone has these words, he finished strong. And he said, Pastor, I've heard you say that so many times. He finished strong. So I just put that on your tombstone. And so when you die, you've already got your tombstone. And I've heard your favorite words. He finished strong. It's already on there. It's a gift from me to you. Mark said he's got that on his back porch. Every time he walks out, he says, I stop in front of that tombstone. 
and remind myself he finished strong. And he said, Lord, I want to finish strong. I pray that every day. I hope that you do. And Jesus is saying that. Be faithful to the end. To the end of your life, stay true to Jesus. So you can put on your tombstone, he, she, finished strong. But Jesus is saying, watch out, guys. Persecution will come. And we know that's what happened into the early church. It came great persecution. It came for hundreds of years. Many of them were put to death. Of the uh, 12 disciples, all except one were martyred. They were either killed at the stake, burned at the stake. They had their heads cut off or some other way. They were all martyred. Persecutions will come. The very guys he's talking to, every one of them died except John, who was exiled and died on the Isle of Patmos. They all died by having their lives taken. But he told them it's going to happen. And you even see that more Christians are persecuted and executed today than any time in history in the world. Okay? Jesus said it's going to happen. So, he says, be on the lookout, be alert, persecutions will come. Then he says, the third thing, watch out. And he gives a paradigm to illustrate what's going to happen. Verses 14 to 23. And verses 14 to 23 is kind of giving a picture of what's going to happen. I won't read all those verses, but he's giving a picture. It's, he's looking at multiple occasions. So, and you, can't, you can look these up later. Just write down Daniel 9. 27, Daniel 11, 31, and Daniel 12, 11. All of those in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, Jesus is describing right here. He goes right back to Daniel, and he's describing what Daniel's talking about. It's called the abomination of desolation. Now, what's abomination of desolation mean? That took place 150 years before Jesus taught the disciples. There's a guy named Antiochus, Epiphanes. He comes in, and he comes into Jerusalem. He hates the Jews. And so what does he do? He goes into the temple, and he has pigs slaughtered in the temple. He has a brothel, prostitutes, brought into the temple. So a prostitution house is run in this holy place of God. Uh, Jewish children, males, cannot be circumcised. They cannot be taught the Jewish faith. Antiochus goes through all these things and even erected a statue of Zeus in the temple, which, of course, Jews had no icons of God or Jesus made it. It didn't do it. So the abomination continues after this happens in A.D. 40. Caligula, a Roman emperor, comes in. He wants a statue of himself placed in the middle of the temple area. So, when Jesus is doing this now, you say, well, that, that's already happened. But again, he, look at, he's trifocaling. This is a multiple occasions. It happened before when he's talking about Antiochus. This had already happened. They knew that had happened. They knew what Epiphanes did. It's going to happen. They hadn't experienced it yet when Caligula comes in. But he's looking again even further into the future, and that's called in the book of Daniel, and we call it the last days of the rapture of the church, the end times, when the Antichrist comes and the temple is rebuilt. The Antichrist will make peace with Israel for three and a half years, and then he'll go into the temple at the end of three and a half years and say, worship me. Okay? That has not happened yet. So again, the trifocals, this happened in the past, abomination of desolation. It happens, it's going to happen in the pretty near future, guys, and some of those guys probably live to see it. But in the long run, church, it's going to happen. That's when the Antichrist comes in during the tribulation period and asks to worship him instead of Jesus Christ and God Almighty. So again, he's given this picture, past, near future, and long term in those verses. So, he winds up then by giving a uh, description of Jerusalem. Uh, when he talks about stone will not be left upon stone. Uh, that happened in A.D. 70. Titus came in. They besieged Jerusalem for months. 
Uh, they tried to starve out the Jewish people. Over a million Jews died inside Jerusalem. Cannibalism, they were eating their own children because they were so hungry. When, when Titus and the legions came in, finally broke through, uh, they saw this terrible bloodbath of, of uh, people eating their own children. Uh, they took 97,000 Jewish men captive, scattered them all over the world. And then when they got through with all that, Titus said, destroy the city. And they tore down Jerusalem. And you can go today, and I've been many times, and they saved a portion of that where the temple was, and you can look at it and you can see the stones that Titus, Romans, legionnaires pushed over. They haven't moved them. Stone upon stone upon stone just cracked and broke open. I mean, it's, I guess, six, eight, ten feet high. That's what Jesus said. It's going to happen. And you can look at that today. Happened exactly as Jesus said. So Jesus is giving them a picture of what's going to be, what has been, and what will be in the long term. So the wrap-up of, of it all is this. Watch out. The king is coming someday. The king is coming someday. Be prepared. In those last verses, he's talking about the rapture of the church, verses uh, 32 to 35. He's speaking of what's getting ready to happen. Watch out, because I am coming back. And this generation shall not pass away. You say, well, if he's talking about something hundreds of years away. What does it mean, this generation? I think he's talking about those that survived 40 years until Jerusalem fell in A.D. 70. Now, it could be, they say, well, the Jewish race will not pass away, or the human race will not pass away. People have different interpretations of that. My sense is that it's the people who are still living, you won't, this whole generation, some of you are going to see what's going to happen to Jerusalem, and it happened in A.D. 70. But in verses 32 to 35, there's that long-term trifocal look. He's talking about when he comes back, and he says, I'm coming back. That's the long-term view. Jesus is coming back. Some years ago, a guy named George Tuck, you may remember this, he was trying to find the wreckage of the Titanic, and he finally found it. And just as he was starting to get, excavate some of the things, a hurricane came through, and they had to stop it. But when they were going out, he wrote down on one of the pieces of the Titanic, I'll be back. So two years later, he went back, as you know, found the Titanic again, some of those pieces going on exhibition, and he went back to where he had written those words, and they were still there, I'll be back. Jesus is writing on the planet Earth, I'll be back, I'll be back. Every prophecy about Jesus coming the first time, every one of them, and there are dozens of them, were fulfilled perfectly. Everything he said about what's going to happen will be fulfilled perfectly perfectly he's coming back but till then what does he say do watch and work watch and work so that that's what that so five times he says watch and the parables of matthew 25 that are surrounded this very teaching he had three parables and it's all about staying working staying busy till he comes finish strong i hope that's your prayer today i don't care what your age is if you're not working, go to work. God's not through with you yet. If you are, stay by the stuff until Jesus calls you home. Stay engaged. And that's, sometimes people say, well, Brother Jim, why don't you just sit back a little bit? I do sit back a little bit, but why? Why should I, why should I keep doing what God's given me a gift to do? I want to stay engaged until he says, come home, or until he comes. And that should be the prayer for every one of us. Be engaged. So Jesus is telling his disciples, then and now, keep working. Now be watching. Signs of the times. Be alert. What's going to be happening? But till then, don't, don't sit there and say, Jesus, come quickly. Uh, you know, I'm going to get in this huddle and wait because it's getting bad out there. It is getting bad out there. But you know, one, one match in the darkness is beautiful. And it lights up a whole room. And you're that light for somebody. Children, grandchildren, where you work, your neighbors, wherever you are, you're that person. 
that Jesus is using to touch other people's lives. So Jesus said, keep watching for me. But till then, work, work. We used to have a song we used to sing years ago called, We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes. I used to hear the old men sing that, that bass line, We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's it. Lord, that don't sound like fun, but it, it's true. <laughs> We're going to work till Jesus comes. And what a privilege it is to work for the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's going to bless us and reward us for that faithfulness. Uh, when I was growing up, I had a Sunday school teacher named Bill Irving. Bill ran a gas filling station, and he's a big old tall, lanky guy, gentle spirit. He taught a bunch of junior boys. You know, anybody that teaches junior boys is great people. And he put up with us kids pulling chairs out from each other and, you know, throwing what spitballs and all that stuff. And I went to the first visit I ever made in the name of Jesus in church. He took me and a couple of guys uh, to go visiting and knock on doors, invite people to come to, to our church. And so I went. And that was my first visitation for in the name of Jesus. I have to confess, he gave us ice cream when it was over, so there was a kind of a little something at the end of the road. But it was, it was I love Bill. Uh, we moved off, and uh, years go by. And I'm in Bowling Green, Kentucky, preaching in a revival, and uh, I get a phone call. And it's, from, it's Bill's wife, Virginia. She says, Brother Jim, I heard you're in town, and uh, we hope we can get over and hear you preach, but uh, could we come by and see you? Uh, Bill would love to see you. He remembers when you were in his class. I said, oh, I'd love to. She said, I'll give you a little heads up. said, Bill's uh, lost his voice, and so he has to write on a tablet. So if he don't say anything, I'll talk for him. He'll maybe write out questions and things. I said, oh, come on. So they came, and I saw this big old lanky guy, age and cancer had done a job on it, but I still knew that wonderful man. They came to the room. We had a great time talking and fellowshipping. And he got ready to leave, and I said, look, we'd have prayer. And he said, give me, he didn't say it, he, he reached for the pad, and he had a pencil out. And so he wrote this message out, and then he wrote it and gave it to me. And he says, dear Jim, he said, I used to be your teacher. I talked for you and with you. I no longer can talk I hope you'll spend the rest of your life telling about Jesus, talking for us. So I've had the privilege for nearly 50 years since then to talk for Bill, my teacher. He worked till he couldn't work. And God's calling you to work till he calls you home or till he comes back. One of the things he's asking you to do is to give him your life. Most important decision you'll ever make. He loves you and he wants to spend forever with you. Everybody makes a choice. Up or down. There's no middle ground. If you've never chosen Jesus, accepted him as your Savior, to give him the rest of your life and then when it's over, to call you home, Today is the day. If you have, you come forward. If you're giving your heart to him right there where you're seated, you're saying, I want to be saved right now. Jesus saved me. He heard that. You come right down this aisle, take Fred by the hand and say, I've accepted Jesus. If you need to join this church, it's his church, you come. Be busy with God's people till Jesus comes. If you need to be baptized, you've been saved, you come. Unashamed, I want to be baptized. I want everybody to know who I am, who I follow. After I pray, we'll sing. I won't belabor the invitation. I believe that the Holy Spirit's speaking. You're responding. You'll come. You stand, pray. Fred, you stand here. I'll pray. Aaron, you'll come lead us. We'll sing. You come. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, thank you for giving us your word. And your word is truth. And we thank you for giving us these teachings that Mark has recorded for generations like ours. Let us, Lord, be found faithful and finish strong. And Father, for those here today who you're speaking to about accepting you, help them just to open the door right now and say, yes, 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 Lord save me. For those
those who are ready to make other commitments, let this be the day. Yes, Lord. Yes. And for all of us, Lord, you've given life and opportunity. Let us, like the disciples, as they heard Jesus, be watching and be working till you come or call us up. Bless this invitation right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Aaron, you lead us. God, come. We welcome you in Jesus' name. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, I still doubt enjoy these weeks with you all. It just went too fast. Uh, I hope Brother Thomas will take another sabbatical soon and invite me back. I'd like to be glad to come back. We love you all and thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brother Jim. It's been a blessing to have you here and you have really stirred our hearts in the Word of God. I just wanted to remind you to be here uh, Wednesday night for uh, all our activities going in. Our choir's back to rehearsing on Wednesday night. We have bi several Bible studies for adults, and we have something for our youth and our children, something for the entire family, so I hope you would consider that and come back. You need that midweek energizing there, so I hope you'll be there here for that. Well, God bless you. Listen to the Lord in prayer as we close out today. Father, Lord, we praise you. We thank you for uh, what a wonderful word that we heard today. Lord, I pray that we would be very watchful 
let us think that perhaps today Christ could return and we need to be alerting everyone we know that doesn't know Christ time is running out so God be with us give us the courage to go this week and to share the truth that's, and the promise of Christ that's in our hearts and lives bless this church Lord in Jesus name we pray amen God bless you